The following presentation was recorded live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 22nd Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers. This is tape number 13, Teaching in Schools. I always believe in starting on time because I always have the saying that the important people are on time. Uh, <laughs> my name is Calvin Campbell. My colleagues here are Jim Ross on the other end and Mike Callahan in the middle. The subject for this afternoon is teaching in schools. Uh, I'll be the first to convince uh, that the moderator has the least expertise in this area because mine goes back more in time, and these two people are doing it underneath modern context. Mine deals more with materials. Uh, after the opening remarks, I think Jim is going to go first, and then Mike is going to go second. I am going to give up about... You know, we agreed on five minutes, right? I want to give up five minutes of my time to Yona Chalk because I want her to tell you what she's actively doing in the state of Hawaii. And then we should have about 20 minutes apiece, and we'll have about 30 minutes at the end for discussions. Rules of the road. Uh, these tapes go back to college associations. They go home with me in my pocket. And I am vitally interested in your questions, as well as the answers. And so if you have a question, we ask that you step to the mic and state your question along with your name, if you would, so that if we need to contact you later for more information, or perhaps with something that we needed to add to our comment, that we do have the benefit of having your name on tape. Okay? And the microphone is right back there. Uh, depending on how the thing goes, we may have a couple little demonstrations up here in the front to help things out. And with that, I will tell you very much, I would prefer to see this room packed clear full because this part of our program is our future. And when you get done with this, I would like to have, if you enjoy the program, be sure and tell everybody next year, come to this one. Okay? With that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Cal. Uh, I'll be speaking essentially along with this outline uh, entitled Teaching Square Dance in Schools, Why? Uh, the other blue page is just a, a reference handout for you uh, that gives you some discussion points for deciding how you're going to proceed in teaching in the schools. Uh, first, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. I've been calling for six years, but my first experience with children's square dancing precedes that by a long ways. Back in the early 60s, I was in a fourth grade class of Mrs. Sharp at Van Wig Elementary School in La Puente, California, and she had a square dance program uh, for us that she did during the music hour. And some of us liked it so much that uh, we started coming after school and square dancing with Mrs. Sharp. Uh, much later, my first experience calling for children was a one-night stand with a Brownie Junior Scout troop just before I started calling for money and uh, learned initially there about same-sex dancing and some of the other issues we face working with children. My first experience teaching children was in uh, 1991 with a beginner square dance class that had a mainstream destination. It was also three-quarters girls, and I learned more about same-sex calling first experience calling and teaching in a school uh, was toward the end of uh, that year. I had three one-hour sessions with fifth, fourth, and sixth grades in our host school. It was less than totally successful. I learned much at this time about the repelling forces between boys and girls. And, uh, yes, and though I had visions of recruiting them for classes, I was uh, perhaps lucky that they even chose to stay in school at that point. I didn't let it dissuade me, though, though at that point I would properly have wondered, and the question we're asking is, why would you want to teach square dance in the schools? And I've organized the answers, or some answers, not the answers, but some answers and some follow-on questions to those under three main categories that you see on your outline. One is for your benefit, the second is to benefit square dancing, and the third is to help out the schools. Uh, if there's no benefit in an activity for you, uh, regardless of how much it helps everyone else, it's often difficult to maintain your interest and your dedication. So I've divided our personal motives into a familiar set of fame, fortune, fun, and personal and professional improvement. 
personal recognition is the first element of fame, and I guess the top level of that was our Bob Ruff, who last year received the milestone for his work with the schools. But what kind of recognition can you expect? Uh, you can be known and appreciated in the schools and in the school system. And you can be known and appreciated in your own square dance community. I've heard it quite frequently. It's so wonderful what you're doing with the children. Uh, that comes sometimes uh, when I've had a long dry spell of not doing anything with the children. But the uh, uh, folks... Uh, Appreciation holds on, oftentimes. Uh, many folks believe that you are single-handedly attacking juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and whatever else. The, uh, in addition to personal recognition, uh, we can get a little bit closer to the financial recognition in getting referrals. Uh, people who work with children tend to get calls for events that involve children. So if they know you're working in the schools, that means you're also available or eligible for birthday parties, uh, uh, picnics, uh, those sorts of things involving children. What was that? Bar mitzvahs, I heard from the front. I haven't done a bar mitzvah. I've done two, done two bat mitzvahs. Only one of them was for ch a child. The other one was for a couple of older women. Okay. Uh, beyond personal, uh, or excuse me, beyond the uh, uh, fame, there's the fortune. And uh, that fortune varies. That fortune varies. Uh, pay rates for working in the schools run from zero all the way up to uh, many more satisfying sums. Uh, 75%. I would guess, of the events that I've done in schools have been gratis, uh, though I've received referrals to paying events from many of the free ones. And uh, engaging uh, what you would expect to be paid, uh, you need to compare that to what you get paid for a dance, what you get paid for a class. Uh, I would say that when you do get paid for school events, it, it is more uh, closely uh, aligned with what you might get for a one-night stand. And for me, that's uh, a multiple of what I would get for a club dance and such. If you're not interested in the money, uh, there's lots of uh, uh, folks looking for volunteers. But even the folks who don't want to pay for something can sometimes feel that they are getting exactly what they pay for. So don't sell yourself short. Fame and fortune uh, lead the way to fun. Do you enjoy being around children? It's hard to have fun if you don't enjoy being around children, if you don't know what it's like to be with children for extended periods of time. Uh, individual classes may be 40, 45 minutes an hour, but, uh, and I haven't had uh, uh, too many of the multiples that one I uh, talked about, the three one-hour sessions, but uh, some of our guys go uh, six and eight of those a day when they're working for our schools. Uh, uh, for, for lack of a better place to put this comment, my quote here says, they learn so quickly. And uh, I say that in quotes. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, they learn in a short time. Sometimes they learn quickly in that short time. Sometimes they've just run out and they've just stopped learning. So uh, you have to be of the sort that is willing to uh, and, and enjoys working at a fast pace in order to accommodate that kind of learning. So working with young folks can be great fun for the right people. Giving them a great time, they will appreciate it, and when they're having a good time, I have a good time and I have fun. Uh, the children are quite prone to regard you as a celebrity. Uh, I've been asked for my autograph by fourth graders. <laughs> Uh, though children sometimes seem jaded in the information age, I think the personal contact by folks who are coming in to entertain them uh, in a special type of uh, atmosphere uh, gives them that kind of appreciation, and that's really fun. Okay, the next area for your personal and professional improvement on your outline, I've already given you the sub-bullets on that where it says patience, clarity, and creativity. These are three areas where I feel I've benefited personally and significantly. Uh, under patience, uh, I wonder sometimes whether I'm practicing patience or just taxing it, but uh, uh, I, I feel I've improved there significantly over my time working with children. Clarity in delivery. This does not apply just to working with children, but to lots of the, what I call the challenging populations, uh, children, seniors, handicapped, uh, whatever. 
greater awareness of what I say and do as a caller in general, I think, has come from working with these kind of folks. A carefully worded explanation in a teach, whether it uh, uh, be with children, seniors, or handicapped, can often transfer back to your adult beginner class or even to your C1 workshop. I don't know where the expression originated. Uh, point your toes at partner's toes. Who uses that? You don't use that? I didn't create that, surely. I didn't. Okay. You can, okay. Well, I don't think I really created it, but uh, uh, I've been using it now for uh, most of the time I've been calling. Uh, speaking to the children and to others, uh, an explanation of face your partner. Uh, we're very prone when we're told to face somebody to turn the face toward them. But when we mean fa uh, face in square dance, we don't mean turn your face toward somebody. We want the whole body to be facing that person. So uh, I use this for all groups when I teach or uh, with one night stands. And there's some other expressions I haven't cataloged that I'm sure I also use for the same reasons. Better understanding of your square dance language will give you an improved available. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, not an improved ability to speak, I guess. An improved ability to convey your instructions to all square dance populations. Creativity is the third area of personal improvement. And I just moved right through my teleprompter to the wrong pa uh, place. Actually, what happened, uh, I printed out the notes for this. And some people lose the file on the computer. I didn't lose that. I lost the uh, printed notes, but, and the uh, file remains here. That's why I have this laptop up in front of me while we're working. Okay, creativity. Uh, question, how many of your singing calls can you reduce to the first five calls on the Caller Lab list? I get some hands out there. A lot of people feel they can. How about to the first four? How about to the first three? <laughs> Very difficult. How about to any, any three? Not necessarily the first three, but any three. Yeah, I've called singing calls from squares, not just from, from squares where I've used circle, forward and back, and promenade. Okay? And you can circle with everybody. You can circle with the heads. You can circle with the sides. Have you ever circled with the partner? You can do that too. Okay. So... Creativity in uh, developing your singing calls to limited amounts of material I think is very helpful. And the singing calls are going to contribute to the children's enjoyment and their appreciation of your program. Okay. How many dances can you use with a group of 60 that is 70% boys? <laughs> Good question. I faced such a group when I had two fifth grade classes combined for, for a PE class. How would you handle that? Any ideas? Grab a partner. Oh, somebody said just grab a partner. So assuming a genderless type of dance. Okay. Yona? Friends and, Friends and neighbors instead of boys and girls. So alternatives to our boys and girls. Okay. So essentially genderless dances. Okay. What else might you do? Count off by twos. Count off by twos. Ag again, that's sort of a, a genderless. That's sort of a genderless approach. That's sort of a genderless approach. Mm -hmm. Very good. And the the, uh, the alternative is to ask some of the boys to cross over and dance as girl. Okay. So, some uh, the audience doesn't seem to think that works, but uh, some callers actually advocate that, and actually some callers have tremendous success with that, arguing for the children that. Uh, the best dancers can dance either side. So would some of the better dancers help us out and take the other side that uh, uh, we don't have enough folks for right now? Right side dancer and left side dancer if they know the right and left. Uh-huh. Very good. Okay. Yeah later, when, uh, and, uh, yeah, later when we get to the how and the what with Mike and Cal, we might hear some more ideas on how to make that happen. Okay. For the benefit of square dancing. A uh, couple of main areas here. To recruit dancers for the 21st century is the first one. And uh, 
a little bit long reaching. Uh, somebody was asking me earlier before the session if I had any luck with some of the uh, work that I've done in getting children to come into my beginner classes. And I talked about it earlier when I had uh, the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade of that school. I had uh, probably 200 kids come through that session, and I didn't get a single recruit from them at that time. And uh, I hope I gave them a good enough impression that they won't look back and uh, uh, decide they don't want to do this sometime later. Uh, but maybe we can plant the seed, even if we can't bring them into our, into our community right now. We can plant the seed, at least have somebody who later on won't say, yes, I did square dancing in fourth grade, and that was the worst semester of my life. <laughs> And part of that, uh, that really ties into change the image of square dancing, which is the other half of that. Uh, again, uh, I did that in fourth grade and I hated it. Can we convert that to, uh, yeah, I did that once and uh, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Or even I had a good time. I had a good time. The music was real neat. The collar was fun. Okay, for the benefit of the schools, the third major area and here... I talk about positive learning experience for the children. And let's look at that first. Uh, what are the education objectives that we can tie into in the schools? On my outline, the A and B bullets merge, so you have them separately. What are the education objectives that we can tie into in the schools? Square dancing, we know, teaches socialization skills courtesies of how to act with other people in general, between boys and girls, or between partners specifically. Cooperation, how we all work together to make the call successful, to make the tip or the dance successful. We teach listening skills, and under the area of listening skills, I advocate that you be a sight caller. Not that you do elaborate uh, facing line resolutions or surprise get-outs, but rather that uh, if you call head ladies chain, side ladies chain, that maybe tomorrow you'll call side ladies chain, then head ladies chain. So they don't always anticipate the dance. Then they have to listen. Square dancing contributes to math skills. Uh, Deborah Parnell posed this to me a couple of months ago while I was talking to her about something related. And uh, this one was a little bit of a stretch for me at first, and I started to look at that and say, math skills. Well, we work in numbers. We work in twos, fours, eights. We walk 16 steps in a circle. We work in fractions. One halves, three quarters. We work in geometric shapes, circles, squares, lines, and others if you have an opportunity to extend the program. Really, what a great reinforcement of math skills that has the potential of being. Okay, in pursuing the education objectives, we may also find out that we can help out the teachers in carrying out that work, we can teach for them. Uh, we might go in and do the whole square dance unit for a couple of weeks, you're the teacher. We might teach with them. Jack Murtha does a lot of this in trying to transfer the abilities over to teachers in his work in California. Jack will teach the first session and he has already required that the teacher get the materials and start preparing. And the teacher teaches the second and third and fourth session. And Jack comes back the next week and teaches one. And then the teacher teaches some. And they work together at it. You can be a destination or a capstone activity. Uh, again, uh, Jack in a, a discussion talks about uh, uh, how motivated do you think a football player would be if they practiced week after week with no game upcoming. And the game for the kids doesn't have to be much. It can be a variety of things. In some schools, I've seen a square dance competition judged by teachers, attended by the principal. Others, 
uh, it's a party with you as the caller, with me as the caller. Uh, in that party, don't teach. <laughs> Maybe one call, just like you might do a workshop call in a club dance. And then the last area we can help the teachers, teach them how to teach square dance or even how to call. I had the fortune a couple of years ago uh, of being asked to uh, work with one of the uh, districts in our area, Prince George's County Elementary Schools, number 128, 128 elementary schools. And they had a PE coordinator who saw me work with one of his schools. I was the capstone activity. Actually, I came after the square dance competition. They got two capstone activities, that group. And he entitled a an in-service hour as Making Square Dance Fun. And I did a program for uh, teachers showing them diamond materials, demonstrating uh, the use of, uh, of them and such. And they decided they needed more before they were really going to be able to use those. And I, I got some grant money, fortunately, and bought out four Friday afternoons for the teachers and we held a mini caller school. I had about 15 really that stayed with me the whole time and uh, of those about eight have active programs at which they are teaching and sometimes calling, sometimes calling. So you can teach them how to, square da- uh, how to teach square dance or how to call. So conclusion, by being aware of the personal ben- benefits available to you and the benefits that you can impart to the square dance community and all of the benefits that you can provide to the schools, you can decide why you want to teach square dancing in the schools and you can select the combination of factors that will ground your philosophy and approach and make you successful. Now, to further develop your approach, let's move on to the how. A nice nice hand for Jim for his presentation. I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. My name is Mike Callahan. I've been calling full-time since 1974. And so the interest I have in the schools has to do a little bit more maybe with the financial aspect uh, because that's part of my income. Um, the I don't travel a lot for uh, you know tours and that. I do a lot of weekends and festivals. But during the week, I'm pretty much home with our local area clubs. And uh, I figured probably my daytime activities, uh, schools, senior citizens, uh, this type of work, probably brings in about 20% of my income each year. So this is what I'm probably a little bit more interested in as far as, uh, as the schools are concerned. The way I started this was quite by accident. Um, one of the school districts about 40 miles from me, uh, this is about 15 years ago, called me up. And they had had a caller come in for a number of years and work with the kids as part of a, a week-long phys ed program on dance. New York State requires a certain amount of, of dance uh, and rhythms units for, for their phys ed programs, and most of the schools in our area do square dancing. Okay, But anyhow, they called me up and they said that this gentleman had another job or was leaving or so forth, and would I come out? They had, I think he had given me a name or something like that. And would I come out for a week and work with the kids? Uh, it was going to be eight classes a day, 40, 45-minute classes, and they would pay me the same that a substitute teacher would make at that time, which was about $40 a day and $0.10 cents a mile. And, uh, you know, for that amount of work, it seemed, boy, that's not an awful lot. But it's something that I wanted to to get into uh, as far as working in the schools, and I figured this was uh, an opportunity to do so. So I did it, and I went out there, and uh, they enjoyed it, and I've been going there ever since, every single year. Okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about a little bit later about how, how they have increased the financial end of this. Okay? But... The teacher liked what I did, and, uh, you know, phys ed teachers have a a great network as far as uh, in-service workshops and things like that. And when they get together, they talk about programs that uh, that they've enjoyed. And from this, I got another one, and from that one, I got another one. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, this year, since the last week in November, I've been in 30 schools, 31 schools, 
and I've worked with 18 elementary schools, eight middle schools, and five high schools in our area. Most of these programs are probably a day or two days at the most. Some are four, okay? And uh, I knew I was going to do this session here, and I know how many kids were in each school that I work with, and uh, a rough estimate, I've seen about 17,000 kids since November, last part of November. So, you know, it's something that... Uh, that really builds up and you don't realize this until you go back and say, wow, that's a lot, that's a lot of kids. Um, one of the things, you know, to get into schools is, you know, how do I publicize my name? You know, how do I let people know what I do and things like that? I come from near Rochester, New York, and the Monroe County Library System puts out what they call visiting artist lists each year. And this is right in the library. And I found out about this. And I called them up and said, oh, yeah. I, I said, you know, can I put my name in? I told them what I did. Sure, no charge. And it gives uh, your name. It gives a little background about what you do. And in the back, it gives a fee, what you charge per day. I wonder how many other libraries in the country do something like that or if anybody has ever called their local library and say, do you put out something like this? And I've gotten a few schools from this type of, type of uh, thing here. If anybody wants to see that, they can. Uh, in Rochester, there's uh, what they call Project Unique, which is a visiting artist type program that the city of Rochester, the, uh, the city school district funds, and they uh, hire artists to go into the city schools and work with the kids. All right. And again, you know, especially I think uh, metropolitan type areas have a lot more of this type of thing than maybe some of the rural uh, area school districts. But, you know, all you have to do is call up your, your school district and, and ask about these type of things. And you'd be surprised at the information that you can find out. Another organization in, in the Rochester area is something called the Arts Reach Program. This is a, an organization that um, handicapped. This, this doesn't have too much to do with schools, but I thought I would just uh, throw this in. Uh, handicapped uh, nursing homes, things like this, will pay dues to this type of organization, and in return, they will send artists into the uh, these type of, of facilities to work with with the people, and they pay me fifty dollars an hour to do this. Okay, which is you know not too bad for for a daytime type of thing. Um, the one thing that I've really uh, that's that's really helped me a lot that I just got involved with this past year is something called the Young Audiences Program. Uh, in the back of your handout, you'll see a directory of all the young audiences. There's 32 chapters uh, over the the United States right now, and this is something in New York that works through uh, New York State educational uh, uh, whatever BOCI system. And what, you, what the school districts do is they pay a certain amount to, to this particular young audiences. It's like a booking agent, okay? And I'll go in, and the school district gets reimbursed part of my fee through the New York State educational system. This young audiences, I found out, it was right in my phone book, on the white pages. I called them up. I said, uh, you know, I told them what I did. They sent me a form to fill out, like an application. I went in, I had an interview uh, with them. Uh, they sent me to a school. They had some people from their board come out and see what I, what I did. And then because of that, I'm now listed in this, uh, it's called Young Audiences Rochester, that all the schools get in the area. It's a book that comes out each year. And they have things in here like, uh, oh, folk singers, um, clowns, um, Bubbleologists, all this type of thing, and uh, again, this is this is another thing that you know was right in the phone book. Okay, so just just a few things that you can do just by you know making a few phone calls to your your school districts to uh, and ask your cultural art people in the schools. You know what is available. Do you do square dancing? You know, I'm a square dance caller. I'd be interested in coming and work with your kids and just see what develops. So another few of ways that you can get into the school systems, perhaps you have a, a dancer uh, that's a teacher, a school worker, 
maybe a, a cafeteria worker or whatever, that, that might be a contact for you. How, how many here, by the way, go into schools? Anybody? Okay, good. Hey, that's great because, you know, we're, we're looking for some ideas also, especially when we get to the, the question and answer period. Okay. These people, these school workers, might be a contact to a phys ed instructor or something like that that, that might be interested in, in having you come in and work with the kids for a day. Um, I found it's probably a lot easier to get into a school that already has a square dance program as part of their phys ed program. Um, most of the schools that have not done square dancing or any type of dance program are very uh, unwilling to try it. Uh, I think a lot of times teachers, especially teachers who have been teaching a while, maybe get kind of set in their ways as far as, you know, not uh, wanting different things. And I, I found out the younger teachers, uh, people that have been hired for maybe a year or two, are more, a lot more willing to change and to get different uh, type of activities going. Again, you have to contact your local athletic director or um, phys ed administrator, a lot of the school districts will have a central office that you can contact and these people can answer your questions, you know, do you have square dancing in your schools or do you have dance, a dance unit in, 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 in your school? Um, many schools have a local cultural arts person that takes care of all this type of activity and you might uh, get referred to somebody like this and again you can tell them what you do that you're interested in, in coming to your school and, and working with the kids and and see what develops from there again I just mentioned about the the local arts organizations uh, a lot of these things are available and all we got to do is make a phone call another thing that's worked out for me a lot and I do this every September is uh, and don't forget, I'm available during the day to to, to do this also. Okay, um, I have a resume, a type of flyer I sent out to every school in the phone book. I did this about 10 years ago. I made a mailing list, and there's about 200 uh, on a mailing list that we got in our little computer at home. Prints the 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 labels, you know, and we put out in the envelope, put the flyer in there. First week of school, I send it out, and uh, you know. I've gotten a lot from something from just doing something very simple like that, and uh, a lot of times, even if I don't get hired from that school district, I'll keep sending those things every year. And all of a sudden, you might get somebody in there saying, "Hey, let's try this." Probably a lot of people, you know, wonder, "Well, who pays for this type of thing?" You know, it's kind of hard to get money out of a school sometimes, especially I know in the Northeast, uh, our school budgets uh, are continually being. Uh, Voted down, right? Um, first question they ask is, do you want payment? Or maybe you'd like to volunteer, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you might be retired from your job. You might have a, uh, a few hours a day available that you, and you enjoy working with the kids, so why not go in and volunteer? Hey, that'd be great. Um, I get paid sometimes through the school budgets. Um, the school I mentioned to begin with, the first uh, in the, the first school I ever did, um, I mean, I told them I enjoyed calling for them, but for $40 a day, went on a 100-mile round trip, uh, you know, for eight classes a day, it was really not uh, too financially uh, sound. But what they did is they approached the student council. And the student council uh, funds things like the junior prom and uh, senior ball and things like And they had money to do things with, okay? And the student council paid me from then on. A lot of schools have PTA groups, uh, parent teachers associations that like to bring in artists, bring in something different for the kids to work with. You'd be, you'd be amazed how much money PTA groups have in their funds to, to do things with. A lot of schools that I work with go through the PTAs. Um, again, in some school districts, there's visiting artists or what they call artist in residency type of, of cultural art funds that are specifically set aside each year to do things to bring in artists and things like that with the kids. And you'd, again, you'd be amazed at, at how, how much money that people have to do things with. Okay. And, of course, this young audiences, which I did, did mention a little bit before. Um, one of the things, you know, you know, it sounds all nice. Hey, boy, this, this sounds like a nice part-time job. Boy, I'm going to go right back and, and set this up. But, 
you know, you've got to consider, are you up to the task to do something like this? Uh, first of all, does your state require to have a degree in education to work in schools at all? Some states do. So uh, if you don't have a, an education degree, they're not going to hire you. Jim um, mentioned a little bit about this, about working in schools. You've got to be a very low-key type of person that you cannot be easily upset if kids start to misbehave and things like this. Um, you can't be a perfectionist as far as the caller lab definitions and the timing list and everything else. You know, you're not going to get a second grader taking eight, eight steps to a dose of dough, you know what I mean? So you, you got to kind of uh, put some of that aside, not all of it, but you got to put some of that aside and, and, and realize the type of group that you're working with. Um, You've got to relate well to kids of all ages and all backgrounds because you meet kids of all ages and all backgrounds. There are very long days. If you go in and do a class, you might, I just did a, a high school. I started at 7.30 in the morning. Okay, can you sing at 7.30 in the morning? <laughs> and do, do eight classes with a half-hour lunch, you know, eight 40-minute classes with like a five-minute break in between. So you have to really have a real correct use of your voice and everything else. Music that kids relate to, this is a big, uh, big thing with me. I, uh, I've made it a personal crusade to try to, to improve the image of square dancing. I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but in the Northeast, uh, when you mention square dancing, you know, you get all this hokey type of uh, activity with the kids, and they think it's, you know, something down in Texas or Tennessee, and that they'll, you know, are out in the hills somewhere. And uh, I try to uh, relate square dancing a lot to recreation. When I talk to the kids about it, I tell them about the, uh, the, the square dance conventions, about weekends, about people uh, taking square dance cruises. Uh, things like this because you know this is something that they can relate to now 20 25 years ago you know maybe uh, the square dancing was the Virginia real type and all that but nowadays you know kids like to hear pink Cadillac and new attitude and uh, and some of the singing calls some of the music they can relate to and this is a real big part of changing the image of square dancing from not just country and there's nothing wrong with country but to something that they can relate to as Jim said, you have, you have to have your judgment of what choreography you can use for all ages. I mean, I've worked kids with kindergarten right up. Okay, what can you do with kindergartners? Well, there's a lot you can do with them. Can you incorporate the traditional with the modern? A lot of the teachers still do teach the Ed Durlacher type of records, which were good in their day, but what you want to do is try to incorporate some of that, maybe a Virginia Reel or a a bird in the cage or a grapevine twist or whatever, and incorporate that in some of the more modern uh, uh, choreography also. So you got to be prepared to do both. And, of course, Jim mentioned singing calls with, with extremely basic type choreography, and this is something that, you know, that you got to do. Line dancing. Well, might, a lot of people might turn up their nose at line dances. Well, I'll tell you, line dancing is very popular. And... Uh, I've done a few schools this year just with line dancing, no square dancing at all. So, you know, it's something that I can put on my resume now saying that I do square and line dancing, okay? And some of the schools I'll go to, uh, maybe we'll do one day of square dancing and one day of line dancing, okay? And, uh, and that, that works out real well, too. Once in a while... A school will like to have me come in and work with the kids during the day, and then at night they have like an ice cream social or something like that to bring their parents back, and that's a great type of activity. Uh, and when the parents see what the kids have done, you know, when you see you know fourth, fifth graders doing a grand square, um, they're they're amazed and they're they're very impressed about the whole thing. And you know, this is another way you can you can get jobs yourself for one night stands for camps. Uh, Companies. I had a, a, a guy who was in charge of a company. Did some for his personnel uh, people because what he saw his kids do during the day in the school. Okay. So these are just some of the things that uh, th that I do that has worked well for me. And I guess the main thing I can say to you is that you know 
don't take anything for granted. Look in the phone book. Start making some phone calls. And, and you'd be amazed what you can find out, uh, things that are already available, uh, people in schools that are just looking for someone to come in and do something like this. And, uh, and I think you'll find it, uh, you know, very rewarding for yourself. And, you, you know, you might be financially rewarding, too. So thank you very much. I'll turn it to Cal. All righty. Uh, about 1967, 68, somewhere in there, we used to get all our records from Capitol and Decca and Folkcraft and Michael Herman. And about that point in time, uh, the major record companies decided that there was not enough profit in this in, to continue the production of their records. But you need to be aware of the big names that at that point in time were producing records to be used in schools. And so square dancing or dancing in schools was a very, very popular activity. If you think back about your experience, you may not be able to remember, but you learn most about what you know now in terms of dancing, probably as a child. Uh, you learned your left from your right, both your feet and your hands. You learned how to skip. You learned how to move in time to music. You learned how to cooperate with each other. You learned how to follow directions, and you learned how to listen. Think about the fact that we teach people how to read, but we very seldom have very much exercise in learning how to listen. I tell people when I go out and work with groups or work in schools or, or, or get in contact with adults that this is an area which has been vacated by the schools. And the only chance we're going to get to fill this void is if we do it. And I tell the fathers and the mothers, dance with their kids. And I tell the dads that father and daughter banquets, if you dance with your daughter now, she will remember it all your life and all her life and hold it as a treasure in her heart. It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big person. I'm 6'2", I weigh plus 200 pounds. A little later on, maybe we'll get a chance to play a game called Elephant's Plane. When I'm 6'2 and I'm out there with a bunch of kids doing elephants playing, and they see somebody up there at 6'2 doing this thing, I don't think they'll ever feel that square dancing is entirely foolish. Now, is this square dancing? I just went to a committee meeting for the uh, Color Lab Foundation, and I've been assured by the entire committee that square dancing is a generic term. That square dancing covers the dancing we do in a four-couple square, that we do in lines, that we do in trios, that we do by ourselves, that this is a generic term. And I would certainly like to think so. I don't think this is the way many people view square dancing, but I would certainly like to think so. Something to consider, and probably one of the reasons I'm sitting up here, uh, is I do a lot of work with the Lloyd Shaw Foundation. And we do a lot involving records for elementary teaching in schools. Uh, we're one of probably four groups of people to do it. He already mentioned one. Bob Ruff's records are still available. Uh, you do, well, I'll have to pick up the name from Wagon Wheel Windsor as to who picked him up, but a teacher picked him up. Jack Murthaw has probably got one of the largest successful programs in terms of size in dealing with a large geographic area as well as the number of schools of anybody I know. Maybe yours is bigger, Mike. I don't know. But Bob Jack's is probably bigger. Easy Records, which is now owned by Johnny Wyckoff, Mirbach Record Service, has also got a very active program down in the Texas area. So music is available. Um, one of the things that somewhat bothers me is that when I was a third grader, and oh, I should relate the fact, where did I start? I started as a fourth grader. My teacher in school taught me how to square dance as a fourth grader. 
That means I've been dancing for 47 years. Yeah, don't look at Dewey. All right. Okay, when I was a third grader, I can quite assure you, I didn't want to hold hands with any girl. I wanted to chase them. Pull their pigtails. Hold hands with them? No way. Uh, when we got together and started taking a look at, at producing records within the Lloyd Shaw Foundation, one of the conscientious decisions that we made was the fact that there are probably a lot of dances that would be a lot more enjoyable to people in kindergarten, K1, 2, and 3, than square dancing. That there were a lot of things that could pave the way to learn how to do square dancing, but it really there were a lot more dances that were more useful to the kids at that age. I would echo the fact that we need to probably put in uh, dances with music that the kids will be more attuned to, and I can give you a good example of this. From the standpoint, if you teach a simple little line dance to something that we now call the electric slide in country and western, the original music was electric boogie. You put on the electric boogie, the kids are going to hit the floor. You put on boot scootin' boogie, and the adults are going to hit the floor, not the kids. And so you very much need to tailor things to the type of things they've got. Uh, you know, I hope we'll relate our little rap story. Oh, that's a, we've got a friend up in Michigan that dances with the kids, and she's a music teacher in the school, and she's got a whole song that goes along with a rap tune. And she says it makes me want to throw up as a music teacher. But she says what I do is I trade off. She says, I give them some of what I want to do in order to get them to do something I want to do. And she says, I know that if I can let them do the rap tune, which they really get into, that they'll be willing to sing something that is more culturally enlightening in terms of music. And I think we're going to have to do a lot of this in order to be able to get the people doing. We, I learned to dance at my father's side. My father taught me to dance. And I dance today because my dad danced. My children dance because I dance. That's where you learn it. I probably would have never become a dancer if my dad had not danced. My children, I know, would not have become dancers probably if I didn't dance. I hope you realize the critical importance of this. Because it is no longer taught in school. They come from the Denver area. The only school system in the entire metropolitan area that still has a dance uh, section in their school is the Denver School District. The rest of them have abandoned it. There are individual teachers which keep it up, but basically the rest of them have discarded it totally. If it's going to get done, it's going to get done by people like us sitting in this room. And if we don't do it, it won't get done. Uh, you've got to look at it from the standpoint of the teachers. I work in a middle school right now. I'm retired. I'm a veterinarian. And I'm also a computer expert. And I work in a middle school as their, their consultant. And so I'm in and out of the teachers' classrooms, and I work uh, in a middle school with the teachers all the time. I can assure you they have far more to do than they could ever possibly accomplish. I mean, when I look at their situation and their workload, I'm glad I worked for the government for 33 years. Because they have got to be extremely dedicated people, and unless they're willing to be extremely dedicated, they're not going to get their job done, let alone teach kids how to dance. Okay, access in. Uh, Yona's going to talk about a couple of ways, I hope, as part of what she does. But keep in mind that you know, our friend up in Michigan said, keep in mind that one of your best friends is the music teacher. Because they do teach music in schools. And we can get access in as part of that element or part of that environment. Uh, Yona's probably going to talk a little bit uh, in regard to social. This is the part I really wanted to tell you, so I'm not going to step on that. 
But there are access ways that we can go to the school system and have it be part of what goes on. Uh, the physical education teacher oftentimes is somewhat receptive, although unfortunately a lot of these people are people who have never danced a step in their life and have no understanding about what dancing does. Flip over, check my notes here. Just as an aside to this, that Cal, many, many of the schools I go into, it's part of, when I'm there, it's part of the music program also. In other words, the music teacher comes in to, right. to the gym, right. and instead of the kids going out and having music, they're all there for the whole day for the dance part. Right. You know, so it's a joint type of thing a lot of times. Yeah, right. Um, something to think about, and we're working on this. I, you know, my primary religion these days uh, is a community dance program because I'm involved as a, as the journal editor and I'm involved as the vice chairman of the committee. But one of the things I'm getting back, I do a lot of work with teaching recreation leaders and teachers of how to do this sort of stuff. And they're saying, hey, I don't have a record player available anymore. I have cassette players available. I have a boom box. The other thing the, the people who work in the gymnasiums tell me, I say, look, man, my voice is shot at the end of the day, and I talk to the, the, the physical ed teacher, and they're coming in, and their voice is shot. I mean, they, they can hardly whisper by the time school's over with. I've been talking to the record companies about producing records. Instead of putting them on pressed records, put them on cassette. Uh, flip sides, where, where people talk, where you're not the performer. When you leave, you've got something to give them. Uh, Johnny Wyckoff down in the Houston, I think that's in Houston, isn't it, area, has two callers who work extensively in schools down there who come in to Johnny, and he makes them custom tapes of the, the pieces that they're going to use in their program for that year that they can then leave with the teachers. The school buys them. Lloyd Shaw Foundation will also do the same. They'll take and make you up custom tapes of anything that you want to have on a tape, which you can then hand to the teacher, and your program can be carried on after you leave. Now, we can't be every place, and so we're going to have to provide the tools to carry on, and we cannot expect the teachers to go and learn these skills. What we're going to have to do is try and provide other ways to get the information to them and out and disseminate in the form that they like. Okay. Um, right now, this is a major part of what I want to say because at this point in time, I'd like to give Yona a chance to talk about what she is doing in Hawaii that I think is perfectly marvelous regarding artists and residents and culture. Or if you want to come up here and face him, Yona, you can have my mic. When Cal said he was going to give me five minutes, I thought he was kidding. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't really have an outline. Um, my husband recently retired from the federal government, and we moved home to the, our home state of Hawaii, and I was starting from scratch. Um, I talked to some of the people in the state. I met a dancer who is in the rec department at the University of Hawaii, and I followed her advice. I put together a program to take into the schools that's a social studies unit in dance history, and I name it the American Folk Dance Program from Colonial to Contemporary. Right at the moment, I'm working on a, a, a fifth grade unit in colonial dancing, but we have in Hawaii a, a royal palace, um, and we had the only king in the country, and at, at the time he was in office was a, about the same time as Victoria was queen in England. So for the 8th grade group, which studies our monarchy period, I am putting together a program of monarchy period dancing, which is English ballroom dancing, not country dancing, but uh, lancers, quadrilles, and so forth. Um, she said, if you put it in as a history project, it's a core project, a, a core program, and when they cut the funding to the rec department and the music department and all the arts and things, the core program stays. So I took that, took note of that, and I put together a booklet that I provide for the teachers ahead of time, which gives a description of the dance, uh, one particular colonial dance that I wrote a triplet, putting together two colonial dances so that they could be danced quickly by modern kids because they don't like to wait around a page on how to make colonial costumes out of t-shirts and scraps of fabric 
uh, that looked pretty good, and um, a sheet of sheet music of contemporary music so that the music teachers feel that they're getting in on the act too. And I've done a couple of sessions where we had music teachers as part of it. One music teacher got so excited she ran out and wrote a dance. She and her kids wrote it together, which put me onto the idea of empowering both the teachers and the children to create their own choreography. And if you take time to explain that you've got four beats of music in a measure and that the that involves four steps, or if you want to double up, you can take two quicks and two slows, or however you want to do it. Um, two quicks and three, three slows, pardon me, or four quicks and two slows, or however you want to break it up. The kids catch on to the patterns very quickly. And if they then go back to their classroom and start putting together dances, uh, it's their dance. And then they really feel that they've had a part in it. I usually work for our local um, artist in the schools or artist in residence. If I go in as an artist in the school, it's a one-shot deal. I do up to three, no more than three, 45-minute or 50-minute periods. And it's just like a one-night stand. It's an exposure. As an artist in residence, I go in for eight one-hour sessions. Um, it can be once a week. It can be eight days in a row. I found that if I do once a week for eight, day, for eight weeks, that they will usually learn about eight different dances. And if I do uh, eight days in a row, that they'll learn 16. So I try to push them to put it closer together because there's no lag time will they forget. I teach American folk dancing, which means I can include anything that's popular, and next year if something else comes around, I can include that without changing any of my handouts or my printed stuff. Um, I usually tell them ahead of time of the first session what we're going to be studying. We're going to be learning different kinds of dancing, where they came from, what ethnic groups brought them into the country, and that the last dance, uh, before the last dance, that we're going to be learning a colonial dance, and that my husband and I both of whom have danced socially with the uh, Williamsburg Heritage Dancers, will come in our colonial costumes. And wearing the costumes makes it a formal occasion. We ask the kids to dress up. And the teachers have been overwhelmed because when the kids come to school wearing sloppy clothes, uh, they never get to see each other as people. They just see each other as that rotten kid in fourth grade that throws mud balls in them. But when they dress up, the boys see the girls in long skirts, because we ask them to wear colonial length, at least ankle length skirts, and they say, gee, you know, you look, you look nice, you know. And the teachers say that we should put that in earlier in the program because they start acting more dignified. We also give them a chance to role play. We explain to them that colonial gentlemen would doff their hat, and because they did a lot of walking and riding, there were no cars, that they had well-developed leg muscles and they would take their hat off and they would do a sweeping bow drawing attention to the well-formed calf of their legs and the ladies would lower their lashes and admire their legs and then bat their eyelashes and simper and so we get the kids into role-playing and we start it off as a fun thing and quite often they keep it up on their own without any further pushing that they do the bowing and the, the curtsying and things without any further pushing on that I have with me, if you want to see later, the booklet that I leave with the teacher, which contains the choreography for all the dances, and I explain to them that I am not allowed to copy tapes and records. I give them a list of where they can order them from, Lloyd Shaw Foundation, other records, but I also tell them that I'm notoriously sloppy about picking up my tapes, and I occasionally leave them behind. And uh, <laughs> most of the school systems have managed to come up with the... Um, tapes. I've been working on what I call a five-year plan. So I have been one year in the school. I've taught to about a thousand children. I went in for the social studies teachers in-service day and did two sessions on dance, one for elementary kids and one for secondary kids, giving a cross-section of American folk dance. And on the strength of that, I was invited to call the after party for the state teachers convention from all over the state of Hawaii, which if you know Hawaii is made up of a lot of scattered islands. So I am now known to teachers from all over the state, and I hope to be able to book into schools and other places. Uh, where I come from, we get paid about $75 a day by the artist in residence program. I usually put all of one grade together, so I'll have 125 to 150 fifth graders in the multipurpose room. And while that may sound frightening, I find that they behave better when they are with other classes and other teachers than they do when they're with their own in-group. 
because they know just how much they can get away with in their own class. <clears throat> but they're not sure of those other teachers. So I've, I've had no problems working large groups like that, and I find it's much more rewarding when you do big circles and then concentric circles um, to get all the kids going. Oh, one of the things I'm doing... One of the things I'm doing is I'm planting the seed. Let go of that cord. <laughs> I'm planting the seed in the kids' minds that for beginning of the school year or end of the school year, they might like to have a social dance. Uh, and I'm, I'm planning on this five-year plan, first to teach teachers to teach. And I've gone to the university and set up a credit course, a one-credit course, that they will get credit toward higher pay. Because if there's nothing in it for them, they ain't going to turn out. And um, hopefully I'll eventually be calling the uh, senior proms for some of these kids. Pretty good, Yona. Six minutes. Isn't that so? I want you to give her a hand. Six minutes. All right. Wrap up for, for, for my part of it. One of the issues that I think we really need to take a serious look at, particularly in the schools and maybe elsewhere, is the issue of cultural diversity. How many of you heard that word? Multiculturalism, the fact that we all have things to, agree, to contribute to the American culture. If you take a look at the American culture and what we've got in terms of dancing, the only thing that we've invented in square dancing is the square dance collar. I mean, for those of us that know history, the only thing that we've invented in square dance collar, Mrs. Shaw used to say that, that the only figure that she could find that we had invented in square dancing was the Alamandar. And one night she came in, she was so excited she couldn't hardly contain herself because she had found, she'd gone to some sort of a folk dance, and there the people up on the stage were doing an ancient dance of their particular ethnic culture, and there was the Alamandar. And she was absolutely in ecstasy because she had found out that there really was no root that someone else had not discovered previously. This is something that is a big, big buzzword within our society today. Take advantage of it, particularly in the schools, because they are faced with this as being an issue as well. We can use this to take the dances and dovetail them in and build a historical tree. You know, we were talking about today up in the foundation of the fact that square dancing is a generic tree, but it has many branches. I mean, we're in a marketing situation that if we want this recreation to prosper in the future, and I don't speak of it as survival, I speak as prospering, then we have to put down the roots, and those kids are the roots, and they have Spanish backgrounds. And they have black backgrounds, and they have Puerto Rican backgrounds, and they have Hawaiian backgrounds, Samoan backgrounds. And what we need to do, they're being taught that their culture is important. And what we need to do is go out and perhaps give them a little of what they would like to have so that they'd be willing to accept a little. That's what we want to have. And we can always join hands in that universal circle to whatever kind of music we want and circle left. Yep. Go ahead. We have a question and answer type period. Yeah, we have questions and answers. Anything you'd like to see? Comments you'd like to make? Oh, yeah. Good luck on that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi. Uh, my name is Luella Reed. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And I have been a dance instructor for about over 25 years now uh, doing all the western square dancing and that sort of thing and I think of it as one of the most important things we can possibly do because I read where, it, where wherever they cut the arts money in the schools they're going to put it in jails I take it very seriously in that way because it's an answer, an alternative to chemical abuse it's therapy. And it isn't well, Socrates said, you laugh at me because I dance like children, but it is necessary for my deportment and my recreation. And so in the class I was just in, when I'm criticized for this and that and the other, 
I just try to let it go in one ear and out the other because I've seen the little girl with a deformed hand that said, Mrs. Reed, I can't do this. Happened to be ballet exercise. And because of my wrist, I said I hadn't noticed. Later, after she'd taken a few courses, she said, I saw her on a street outside a recreation place, and she says, guess what? I'm the disco queen in here. <laughs> and that was all I needed. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please, name. Uh, Jerry Hardy, Stone Ridge, New York. I'm a music teacher in Stone Ridge as well as a square dance caller. I was delighted to hear the, the emphasis on music and getting involved with the music teachers. I think an idea I have is uh, going through your local state school music association. Every state has one. And I will be presenting something similar to what Ona is doing to uh, the New York State School Music Association in November. And I have also entitled it the American Folk Dance. And it will go through presenting two music teachers with a demonstration fourth grade square of fourth grade dancers, how you can use uh, historical dances and bring it all the way through to the Western square dance. And I, I think presenting it to them and seeing how they can do it themselves also. There will be two sessions. Then the afternoon session would be them getting up and doing the actual dances also. So I think the emphasis on the music, I think uh, rather than phys ed, I, I appreciate the phys ed having it in their program. But going through the music teachers will further emphasize that movement and that rhythmic movement that the kids need so, so much these days. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi there. My name is Art Budlack. I'm from Western New York, right, Mike? Uh, namely, uh, right side, right outside of Buffalo. Uh, I got into square dancing about 20 some years ago, and I also took up round dancing and eventually clogging. And because I was doing clogging, I had some equipment. And one day, uh, my caller could not uh, uh, keep a calling date, which was at a Girl Scout camp. And he says, go out, you can do it. Well, I had never done it before. So I went out there, and guess what? I had such a good time with those kids, I said, I'm going to become a caller. And that's how it happened. But that's just one part of the story. What I really wanted to tell you is... Uh, I got a call a couple years ago from a school, and we talked over the phone, and I was hired from 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they said they would have various groups come into the main gym gymnasium, and that I had to teach these various groups. Well, evidently they had a square dance program already established because some of the teachers, and they usually are the gym teacher, if not the music teacher, that will teach. Their, their students uh, before I got there. But what was interesting about coming into that uh, gymnasium is that they had uh, 15 or 20 squares laid out with tape on the floor. <laughs> and at a particular time, from a third or fourth grade up to the eighth grade, they would come in at a designated hour, come and sit into that little square and wait for me to start. So that was real good because all the squares were formed immediately. But the, the interesting part was from third, fourth grade up, I had to change the tenure as we got up to the older students. My question to you, Mike, is how high of a level do you take your students? You mean what do I teach them? Yes, uh, I mean, you know, you're going to teach them so many calls. How far do you go up? Because I thought I had gone up pretty far when I got up to Grand Square. <laughs> For, for, for what age? Well, uh, because there was a slide from fourth grade up to eighth grade, yeah. I saved it to the seventh and eighth graders to, to uh, do, uh, teach them at Grand Square. Yeah. I'm not really, and I tell the, the phys ed teacher when I come in here, I, I'm not really interested in, in how, much, how much they learn as long as they've got experience with it. And, uh, you know, s sixth graders can do a Grand Square real well. You know, you can teach them... Um, uh, so, sometimes, like seventh and eighth graders, you you can go into uh, you know 
right and left through. You might be able to, I, I might do a pass through in a California twirl. Some, for some reason, kids like to hear the word California twirl. I think that's really great. So I have like the, I'll show them how the heads can pass through in California twirl and the sides pass through in California twirl and circle left till we get back home or something like that. Um, any kind of a call that's sort of an exotic name, square through four hands. You can t teach a, an eighth grade square through four hands just from normal facing couples. Well, you know, I pretty knew I easily. couldn't do that with the fourth graders. That was a little, little tough, I think, for yeah, a fourth grader. Yeah, but, but I mean eighth grader could, could do that. But things that were, they have a lot of activity going at once, you know, kids like to like that type of type of thing. They like to hear calls and they like to learn calls they haven't heard before on their on their records that they've already had in, in the gym classes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, eighth graders, I, I, I would teach them. You know, I could teach them heads lead to the right and circle to a. Maybe the second day I was there, I would do heads lead to the right, circle to a line, and I might do like a ladies chain from a line or a right hand star, left hand star from a line, or even a pass through and bend the line. I might do even that. You know, if well, they're re really good. My experience at the school was a one time shot, so yeah. I, whatever I taught them that one day, that was it. Yeah. But I I thought they would call me back for another session, but it didn't happen. But now that I'm attending this session, I see it's up to me to let them know that I'm available to do such things. Well, one, one of my best experiences, I've done this past three years now, is I go into a high school in Fairport, New York. It's a huge school, and it's a high school. And I'm there for two days, and the last day, they have what they call a square dance contest. And they say, okay, you guys get your squares together and come down. And they have, like, the football coach there, and they have the principal there. You know, people that the kids really think highly of as judges. And uh, we'll, we'll get them down, and, and I'll just do singing calls. And these guys will go around with their clipboards and all that stuff. You know, they make a real big deal out of it. The winning square gets T-shirts, the star square 95. Second place square gets Pizza Hut stuff. Uh, third place square might get a, a certificate to the local bowling alley for a couple of games, something like that, you know. But I had 32 squares of kids dancing. This in one time in this particular square dance contest, some came down dressed up. One square came down and they cross dressed, and the guy took the girl spot and the girl took the guy spot. These are high school kids now, but they had a hell of a time, you know. And I think that's if you know if you can make an experience like that too. Competition sometimes kids go for that. Okay, just a couple more things to add. I hate to take up a lot of time, but there's a, a couple other things that I thought were interesting that I had done. Uh, sort of spontaneously, and uh, when I when I have a group of young kids that I'm going to do this for, what I've done sometime during the day, uh, probably towards the end, is to bring up either their uh, scout masters or their teachers and bring them up to square dance and make damn sure that they make a mistake because the kids love it when they blow it. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is when I when I do an all girl scout uh, group where there's all girls or something like that. Uh, one of the things I, I found out they like the best is some for, form or some version of a Virginia, uh, Virginia Reel. Right. Okay? And what I did, you're talking about exotic names. Instead of just telling them to uh, peel out and uh, go down to the end of the line and form the arch, I said, that's just like the banana, so I call it peel the banana. I say that every time that I call a Virginia Reel. And where I found out that it was very impressive that when I'd go back to these same groups a year later, the kids would run up and say, are you going to do pen the banana? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Jim, did you want to say something first? Uh, no, I think Mike covered it. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll catch. Uh, Slim, go ahead. I also have been going into schools now for about 35 of my 47 years as a square dance caller. Dad was a school principal, mom was a school teacher, so there was a background there. I worked primarily southeastern New York State with a small pocket of interest up in the Adirondacks north of Utica, which was my home country originally. Uh, one of the three areas that I go in and I slant my program accordingly is music department, social studies department, or phys ed. I'll apply just one of the techniques I use in phys ed for winning the youngsters over, and that is I draw the analogy that the modern square dance caller with teaching component parts of a square dance uh, is like the square dance, uh, like the quarterback on a football team. We can change the signals at the line of scrimmage, so therefore it's a constantly changing pattern, like a kaleidoscope. 
and we win the youngsters over, especially the male youngsters, in terms of watch out, I'm going to call a line, some change at the line of scrimmage and fake you out. Think I'll be able to fake you out? Not till us today, man. And for what it's worth, that particular technique works for me in the phys ed side of the program. Yeah, before we get too far away from the competition, uh, competition is a part of every kid's life. Uh, they compete. We compete in society. We compete with our wives. We compete with the companions. I fly hot air balloons, and hot air ballooning right now has become very competitive. I don't compete. I want some things in my life that I do just because I want to do them. And dancing is one of them. And hot air ballooning is the other. I want to have things to where all I do is go and enjoy myself. And I think we are doing a disservice to the children when we put them up and judge them on their skills in dancing. Because this is part of one of the problems of square dancing today is the fact that we have constant pressure to excel. Jonah Chalk again. Um, I frequently am asked to judge contests in various things and I always decline. I say for every winner you have a whole bunch of losers and I have no intention of making enemies out of all the losers. But I use the challenge idea when I do hash singing calls, uh, hash calls rather. I'll tell the kids now it's my job to try to fool you and your job to make sure I don't do it. And the teachers really like that because it teaches listening skills. And it's one of the things you can reinforce. Um, I also tell them before I even start teaching that there are different ways of learning. Some people learn by seeing, some people learn by doing, some people learn by hearing, some people have to write it down and then figure it out at home and come back and do it later. And that the people who learn fastest may also forget fastest. So just because you learned it right now doesn't necessarily mean that you know it better a month from now than the guy who's having a little trouble learning it. People forget to tell kids that they're not all alike and they need to know that they, it's okay to be different, okay to be a little slower to pick it up if you remember it longer. Okay, other comments? One of the things I found too that uh, when you go into the schools, uh, the kids that aren't really athletes or, or jocks or whatever uh, really enjoy the square dancing because it's something that they can excel at with everybody else and it puts everybody on a pretty pretty much even par even some of the kids that are that are slow learners and things like that maybe have a learning disability uh, when they they come into the square dancing it's probably one of their favorite units because they don't feel as though they're uh, a separate uh, entity of, of people at that point they all come in and they all join in together and they all have a great time so that's something you've got to think about when, you, when you're working in schools is that it sort of equals out the, the athletes, the popular kids, the, the leaders, and the kids that aren't so popular, too. And that, that uh, really makes it all worthwhile, I think. Got to tell you a story. When I was in high school, I was probably one of the clumsiest kids in school. I could not run down a football field. I tripped over the goal line. I tripped over the free throw line. I tripped over the baseline. I could dance. No problem getting dates. None of the jocks could. <laughs> Next. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Ray Wilson. I'm from Sardinia, Ohio. Uh, two years ago, I got a call from the uh, local uh, junior college. There's a group that uh, works with the uh, learning disability type children, and they want us to come out and teach square dancing one day, one weekend, on a Saturday. What they did, uh, they told me we have 500 children. They brought them in 50 at a time for about 45 minutes. Uh, what we did was uh, we did a lot of improvising. Square dancing looked a lot different that day than what it does when we, when we do square dancing. I went home dead tired. 
I got another call very shortly when I come back out to another junior college in another county. This was Brown County, the Hill Highland County, which is a neighboring county. When they score and do it at that county, we've been doing the same thing now for the last two years, uh, on uh, twice a year. This year we've created incorporated line dancing, which looked a great deal like our square dancing, of course, but it was it had a different title. Uh, one thing they told me was that they don't have the funds to go out and hire people. They asked somebody to come in either from Chicago or someplace to come in and do dancing interpretation or something. They wanted like five thousand dollars. They didn't have this kind of money, so they raised money to do this, having different things. And if there's anything left over, well, I have them contribute to a local scholarship fund or something like that. In other words, I do it for, for nothing. And uh, there's a lot of, I'm sure there are other places that want to do the same thing. And it's, uh, it's hard work, but it's a lot of rewards for it also. Okay, other comments? Just yank it out of there. Just it's, it's okay. in a holder. Go ahead and grab it. Out. Jim Glenn from Los Angeles, California. I teach in the Los Angeles schools, but I teach the whole year round. So the fourth graders and even the second graders can do all the calls that the adults can do when they're out a whole year. The second graders we start them off, but by the time they get to fourth grade it's easier to teach them. They're not ready for it. However, they do make money for the schools because in the fourth and fifth grade we go out and do exhibitions at different clubs like the Masonic Halls and we'll get maybe a check for 250 up to $500 for the school which the school can use any way they like and it doesn't have to go through the school board. Anyway, these kids learn how to do progressive dancing and in the center squares they'll do things like teacup chain, red hot, daisy chain and Venus and Mars and yeah the kids can do anything that we can do. I'm not, uh, I hope you didn't misunderstand me, I didn't say that the kids couldn't do it, what I said is that we felt that there were dances that were much more suitable to their age group and things that they would probably enjoy more. Uh, one of the reasons for doing this, I should add, is the fact that in, when I was going to school, and I've heard this out of other people, that square dancing was a reward. That you, you learned all the dancing through schools, but you couldn't square dance until you were in the fourth or fifth grade. And by the time you were in the fourth grade, you really were looking forward to the section on square dancing because this was something that the big kids did. And it was a reward for us. You know, you could, I can, I teach, uh, uh, one time when I was in college, I uh, worked with a uh, girls quadrille team on horseback. And you can literally teach horses to run the whole routine with no hands on the reins. You can teach anybody anything if you spend enough time doing it, and I think it's probably all right. Uh, what I am trying, hopefully, to communicate is to really sit down and consider whether or not it is appropriate to teach first, second, and third graders. It's possible. I just question whether or not they enjoy it. You know, we were talking about, you earlier said something about the physical repulsion between girls and boys. And that physical repulsion exists until about the fourth grade. And all of a sudden, the boys and the girls discover that they really aren't real bad. I mean, before that, pulled some pigtails and whatnot like that. But about the fourth grade, they start getting into the stage of where it's cheap. It's neat to watch the, the, uh, the people at the middle school level and this blossoming that's going on during the springtime between the boys and the girls. They no longer hit each other. I mean, it's neat to watch this going on in the schools, and this is the sort of thing I hope I was trying to communicate. Okay? Yeah, I want to respond to the other side of that comment. And uh, Yeah, you want to take the mic up? Here's this one. is not. This it may one's be not dead. 
They pulled the plug? Okay. Yeah, okay. As I said, I want to respond to uh, the different side of that comment. It sounds very much like the gentleman has uh, what I would call a children's club and exhibition program, the uh, amount of time uh, that you're able to have with them. And uh, uh, following on from the previous question about how far do you go, and you go as far as your time, their abilities, and your ability allow you to. Uh, when I did the the pseudo caller school for the uh, teachers, I uh, front fronted that with a 45 minute lesson for a fourth grade class, and we went through 20 calls in the aggregate of three hours, and they were really pretty competent at that. Uh, had I more time, we could have gone farther, or we could have gotten better at what we were doing. And uh, had I uh, not had them separated by a uh, week, uh, consecutive Fridays, as Yona says, if I can get eight days in a row, uh, we could have gone 32 calls, the whole double diamond program. One of the, the problems I run into, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, can you continue this on sometime? Well, most of the schools in our area, you know, they'll have a, a week or two for dance unit, and then, then they go on to basketball or uh, or the next unit or whatever, you know. So they square dance for a week or two, and that's it till next year, you know. And the kids have a good time, and, and a lot of times the kids say, gee, you know, is there any place we can go, you know, and, and continue this? And unfortunately in our area there's not. But, uh, you know, for the week or two that they do do it, they really enjoy it. But it's just more or less a unit that's planned by the, the phys ed people, in September, you know, each week is something different. So, yes, this gentleman. Uh, yeah. Dave, Dave Brown from Delaware. Uh, first of all, in our area, we don't have what well, we you have to work through the individual teacher because individual elementary teachers have discretionary amounts that they can, and they'll get to what they'll do is they'll get two or three of them to get together, and they say, "Can you come and work with our students?" And they'll have they'll reserve the gym for whatever amount of time they have, and you go in. And uh, and I find if you don't challenge, if you don't keep going, as much as they're able to learn, they get bored. And, of course, I, I, I do line dancing, too. And I, tr um, I tried to relate. Have, there's nursery school programs everywhere in our state. And the kids learn birdie song and, and, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Hokey pokey and that sort of thing, and I use them Western style, you know. I'll, instead of doing circles with, for the pretty song, I'll make a right hand star, left hand star. Heads make a right hand star, left hand star. Relate the things that they've already already have learned, and you don't need to start to teach over again. One of the problems you have too is you have elementary kids who who do square dancing for for maybe fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And they use the same records each year, each year, you know, and pretty soon, oh, man, not that song again, you know. And that's why when you can come in with different music and, and, and different figures and things like that, you know, it really perks them up a lot. Keep in mind, more variety does not mean more terms. Right. Uh, CDP program works with 24 basics. I've got a book that will be out in June that has over 400 dances in it, in lines, in contras, in squares, in trios, in mescalanza, in Sicilian circle. It uses probably, you know, you've got a tremendously broad range of music and a lot of things that you can go pick out in music that will add a tremendous variety. You don't have to have a lot of terms. I do one night stands, eight terms. That's how I teach it, with eight terms. And that's all. So you don't need to have a large number of terms. What you need to have is a large number of dances and a large variety of music. Yona? Yona Chalk again. Uh, the business of where do you go after you've taught them. I uh, arranged with the State Square Dance Foundation or Federation in Hawaii that does an annual state convention to get daytime in the dance hall for school kids. And this year was the first time I've tried it, and we only got the publicity out two weeks ahead, and I got 75 people. Uh, they were so impressed that it's on the bill for next time. We'll have more publicity earlier in the year, and we will limit the registration to 250. So if they want their kids in, they have to register early. Um, I'm also approaching the Recreation Department to try to set up a once-a-month community dance program 
dance at a different rec center each month so that each rec center hosts a dance. Hopefully, all the kids in that area and per perhaps from other areas will be able to dance at that dance and I'll be able to post a year's worth of dances so they'll know where they can go to use the material that I teach them in the schools. Okay, we're, we're up in time. I'm sorry to cut it off, but it, it's 5 o'clock. I would like to have you give a big hand to Jim Wass, <laughs> Mike Callahan, and please, to yourselves, for your excellent participation, I hope you picked up some ideas. Okay? See you later, gang. Let's do one more.